I hope you liked our introduction and let's get it started for the first week. Oh yes, um, this is a class about um, inference in a scale, inference at scale, uh, data science, big data, Teruge scale, right? Kind of big scale, right? We are here to make sure you have the tools for making good decisions based on large and complicated data. A mix of practice and pri principles, solid understanding of essential statistical principles. I told you, statistics, econ, and psychology, right? You need those, right? Before jumping into AI or whatever, right? Uh, you need a concrete analysis ability and the best practice guidelines. So we are going to go one by one and we will learn what to trust, how to use it, and how to learn more, okay? Zimbabwe inflation rate, trust it or not? right uh hands on the subject um well it's i'm trying to argue that you know oh, the stereotype that business guys are non number guys non quant guys no we have to challenge that right i'm sorry for being uh majoring in non quantitative discipline that's a typical buzzword for uh the buzzword a uh, word um, criticizing the situation of this non-quantitative guys not being able to get a job, okay? High unemployment rate. But, I mean, there's a, a misconception or stereotype that MBA guys, what do you know about numbers? And then the, you throw out those numbers to the number crunchers of the engineering department or something like that. But here we are challenging that stereotype. And we are driving you to be the crunchers of the numbers. Okay, so let's go. Um, there, you know, what is in a name? Big data, right? Um, econometrics, statistics, and machine learning, all these things, right? Whoa, scary. Well, familiarize yourself. You're, you will be one of them, right? There are many labels for what we do econometrics or called statistics, if you go further, you know, it's like data mining and big data and data science, right? Um, and then if you, if you take one step further and then they call it machine learning and algorithm, uh, what's that algorithmic trading, but artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence or AI, right? Such a buzzword, but my friends, right? tell us that you know AI is a kind of an overstatement but ML is more of a conservative statement so take that note along this spectrum you move from a heavy focus on what things you are measuring uh, what real phenomena they uh, correspond to to a more pragmatic useful is true pattern recognition approach um, Whatever pattern that you recognize, Zimbabwe's inflation rate and S&P 500. Yeah, that's useful, useful. Yes, let's use it. Um, that's the extreme. Okay, uh, the econometrics uh, is more going back to the economic theory and think clearly about what is driving behind. Okay, um, the similarities are much bigger than any distinctions. Big data, BD, right? The name comes from computer scientists working to do aggregation on data that is too big to fit on a single machine as aggregation become analysis. BD got closer to statistics plus machine learning. And after a healthy dose of hype, everything is fairly confused. Okay, um, Data science is an umbrella term for inference in a world that is messier than in your old statistics textbook and big data is data science focused on business and industrial applications. So here we infer patterns from complex high dimensional data. Um, simplicity and scalability of algorithms is essential and we keep an eye on both useful and true uh, patterns, right? Um, the end product is a decision, so decision making under uncertainty. Buy or sell the stock, right? To, just to help you. A big aspect of big data is a pattern recognition or data mining. 
um, the economist in Chicago, right? Or I'm talking about neoclassical economist in Chicago. Of course, you may wonder, didn't you say Matt Teddy used to teach in Chicago? Yes, but that's Booth School of Business. Booth School of Business. Um, as opposed to the economists that I'm talking about are those economists in economics department. 경제학과 versus 경영학과. Totally different. What do you mean totally different? Aren't you the same uh, egg-headed, like big-headed uh, scholars anyway? And then the theory, uh, you say it, and you say it. Theory, uh, let me change the color over here. Theory, economic theory, let's say, versus econometrics. Kerryang Kyongja metrics. Econometrics or statistics. Right? Aren't they the same? You may wonder, the MBA is typically, I mean, when I fresh graduated from uh, MBA, I was like, aren't they the same? I was in, the, in your shoes too, right? What do you mean theory is different from econometrics and theory stuff versus those applied stuff, right? Um, what do you mean? Applied stuff is econometrics, okay? And theory is pure mathematical theory okay whatever you prove in mathematical rigorous manner with something called qed okay that's pure economic theory and that's where you get nobel prize you get nobel prize only when you have a solid theory like that qed thing Econometrics or data or statistics, it's not a theory. It's just an applied stuff. Lower level, they would say. Okay? Fine, I'm good to be the lower level. But the guys in Chicago, the economists over there, they don't you know, associate themselves with this data stuff, applied stuff. They say, I don't do applied stuff. I do theory. I call me a mathematician. All right. Oh, high level guys, right? And that's why they get Nobel Prize, okay? Um, and then what I experienced as an MBA student, right, was a case study. Sare, case, case. What do you mean? Let's take LBO for example, leveraged by out. A famous case of leveraged buyout, okay, is what? RJR Nabisco. Have you watched the movie, um, The Barbarians at the Gate? Okay, go ahead and watch it. Very fun movie, a very specific case about how to take over a tobacco company called RJR Nabisco. Um, famous for Oreo cookie, by the way. And then take over and get it out of the stock market and take it as private and then discipline the management by borrowing tons of money using their fixed assets as a collateral and borrowing from the bank right and then load up a lot of debt on this balance sheet so that the management the ceo will have to work hard like crazy otherwise the company will go bankrupt so that's a good part good um, that's a good uh, case talking about the agency problem, agency theory of capital structure. Part of the reason why you borrow more debt from the bank is to discipline the CEO. It's running 100 meters race by putting a shepherd, German shepherd, right behind you. Otherwise, you will be bitten up, so you will have to run like crazy, right? Um, the CEO have to work hard, otherwise he would go bankrupt. So that's a nice theory, agency theory of capital structure. And there must have been a lot of cases of 
LBOs, right? Hundreds of different leveraged buyouts cases, uh, the, the sample data um, supporting this theory, okay? Supporting this theory. And out of those sample, the academicians, like professors like me, found out an interesting case, RJR Nabisco. Ooh, this one is a very interesting and sexy story so that we can teach in the MBA classes where the students don't know much about the mathematics and get freaked out when we impose all these data so that we can tell their story in one nice way. So much so that it was built up uh, as a nice movie before. So Google search or YouTube search barbarians at the gate, you will be able to watch that movie. That's just one case and that is what MBA education used to be like, okay? And you go talk to your bosses in your field, uh, especially Korean uh, bosses. They usually say what? There's a 성공 사례가 뭔데? What's the? Uh, is there a case study about success story related to any of your business idea? Okay, what does that mean? Well. Whatever I suggest as a consultant to this boss, right? The boss will be accepting my story e only if there is a success case study about that specific idea. Okay? Tell me Harvard case study. Only by then I will be convinced to follow that case and then practice it in my company. Right? That's the basic approach of business education conventionally. Now, what's the problem? Number one, besides this big data issue, this case study works only if you are a follower, okay? If you are a forefront manager, right, and then beating the competition as a top guy, don't look for a success case study, right? By the time the case study is made, it's too late. It's too late, okay? Somebody already made money. The chances of opportunity is gone. The market is in the efficient in the long run. How can you be taking the same opportunity, right? Like that. So that's one reason that I don't like case study that much. Ah, number two, case study, right? Case. Uh, what was I trying to say? Um, case study has its own limitation, right? Um, you need to have some solid understanding of how the sample looks like instead of just focusing on one typical case. There the case study, Harvard case study was good because those Harvard professors were good at picking up very uh, stylized case. Oh, this is RJR Nabisco. Yeah, that's great. Right? Kind of, you know, representing the theory in a very succinct manner. They had to do all the painful job for you guys. But the, ch the challenge with this big data is that it's asking you to go beyond those case studies. You have to be the one to understand those sample data, supporting those economic theory behind it, right? Those economic theory, mathematical proof of those crazy math, right? We are not asking you to do that. That's something the economist and then the finance theorist do it, okay, for you. What we do over here is go for the data, a lot of different cases, right? A lot of different cases, right? Um, hundreds of different observations. What is a pattern that you find, okay? Instead of waiting for the professors to come and tell you, oh, this specific story, is uh, something that you have to learn about this capital structure theory or portfolio theory kind of things. So this challenge is asking you to be more proactive in going directly into this source data instead of waiting passively. Oh, give me, f I, I want the spoon feeding of your nice case study. Um, yum, 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 right? No, you have to be the one to go and hunt for that pattern, right? So that's one thing that I have to tell you. But then again, 
here this page is about the distinction between this statistics econometrics versus economic theory okay those economists what we mean by them Bob Lucas the Nobel Prize winners right those are theorists mathematician they position themselves as mathematician I told you before unless it is provable by mathematics don't bother me that's their attitude okay um, so that's the theorist guys right for them this econometrics or working with this data is a dirty work low level guys case study even lower do they want to teach these economists right do they want to teach in business school no no I know some professors that specifically chose not to teach in business school was originally employed by business school but they said screw it I'm not gonna teach uh, business school guys um, because I am a mathematician and I belong to economists the higher level ones right uh, there are some cases like that okay significant number so you see that hierarchy going on there okay sorry about that but we the business school guys are going trying to go up from the case study level to sample based study data based study okay that is the part um, we've been missing in our explanation before okay why do we need AI study in business school kind of things right um, so we are leveling up that's the thing okay and then for the economist perspective right why did they think perceive these data work as dirty okay it's a limitation there well they had their reason why it's not just the arrogance but because of the limitation in this approach conventional approach of econometrics or statistics convincing this economist when they are making some policies right macroeconomic policies for example Bob Lucas was the one okay macroeconomic policy well what do you have well Federal Reserve or central banks their idea or their their mission is to what minimize uh, unemployment rate and then lowering those inflation rate fighting against unemployment and fighting against this uh, inflation has been their um, work primary target right of their work right and then they need to set up some you know every now and then the central bankers or the government uh, announces some kind of a policy to uh, fight these two enemies right the economic policy they announce would they have some impact significant impact on either of these variables unemployment rate versus inflation right the historically and uh, previously right Phillips curve was there uh, by looking at those data of unemployment rate and inflation rate now Phillips curve found out there's some infl inverse relation going on um, historically right um, whenever there is a lower inflation then the what the uh, what's that whenever the un un unemployment rate is low the economy seems to be overheated so that the inflation takes off there's kind of a uh, in relations going on like that okay so based on that data can the economist uh, or the policymakers announce something and then influence the economy so that they would how I say I would say lower down the unemployment rate by announcing some kind of a monetary policy okay Bob Lucas said no no okay why is that the case because it's endogenous everybody has their own rational expectation about certain announcement okay by the time the policymakers some uh, do some announcement the investors in the market and then the market participants in the, all those uh, real economy they will act based on their expectation even before any announcement okay those announcements 
people have some anticipation about it okay anticipation about it so that those announcements will not have an effect at all okay will not have an effect at all because those market participants are rational and then they already expect something over there okay um, and then try to act strategically uh, we call it Lucas critique right um, this is famous uh, story that uh, Lucas was telling right um, well let's say you are the policymaker about uh, uh, spending for the security of your region okay region by region location by location city by city uh, you need police forces how much do you have to spend as a government on those security forces right money spent on security forces should be a function of crime rate the more crime do you see like in manhattan or bronx or whatever areas right or hyde park thank you chicago right hyde park um high crime rate you need high spending on um those police forces right but if you look at the data interesting thing is fort knox over there the crime rate is extremely low whereas the spending on the police force or security is extremely high aren't we wasting our money okay you might challenge if you are just simply basing your judgment on the data okay what lucas was saying is that look behind think behind what is driving the data over there okay Fort Knox crime rate extremely low even though they are spending on the uh, uh, security is extremely high why is that the case well they have the country's gold bullion storage over there Fort Knox like this okay um, so that's why so if you lower down that spending on the security right guess what will happen extreme crime will happen to snatch those gold right and there is a reason why the data is pointed at that specific point there's endogenous reason why okay if you want to put some uh, policy economic policy um how to make it more you know yeah it is impossible to make an uh, exogenous uh, policy that can influence uh, you know, the economy into a certain direction everything is endogenous right there is a reason why okay you the econometricians using those data you guys are silly you know you have to think more about those kind of uh, uh, drivers behind that data generating process ah that's what these guys are claiming neoclassical economists around the Great Lakes you see Chicago, Minnesota, Carnegie Mellon on that Google map, right? Why do I show you this? Bob Lucas is in Chicago guy, right? And then Minnesota where I graduated. Yeah, that is a place where these guys get together. And then perhaps economist, right? This mathematician-like economist, pure economist. Don't call me that. Um, those pure economists that we talk about over here, you will be able to find many of them in Minnesota and Chicago and those guys make how do you say associate themselves and have good time uh, conferences in Minnesota because Minnesota has more than 10,000 lakes just you pick one of them such a beautiful place right during the summer and then uh, have bar barbecue parties and then conference during the daytime that's what they do and then Minnesota uh, has been was very famous for having Ed Prescott um, another Nobel laureate right he was a big shot together with uh, Tom Sargent and Chris Sims and then other guys right big big Nobel laureates were stationed in Minnesota before and uh, they were associating with Bob Lucas of course Eugene Fama and then all these guys right and then the macroeconomics theory was you know generated over there and then the most famous macroeconomics book for PhD level guys is this book, 
recursive methods in economic dynamics by Stokey, Lucas, and Prescott, right? I show you this Prescott picture over there. Uh, the reason I tell you this guy is that he used to have a website in the uh, Federal Reserve in Minneapolis. And then there in the front page, the first sentence he said was, progress, do not regress, right? Specifically criticizing those econometricians because we, econometricians like us, right? Data guys like me, we do regressions. But these economists, they say, progress, do not regress. That is the, their perspective about this data science thing, okay? But here, the Matt Taddy is saying that we have to wake up. Those economists wake up. Those data, okay, the, those, uh, the, the data with a lot of uh, you know, limitations, um, those, those days are going by, and then nowadays we have big data, and then those data that we collect right now, we are able to collect, gives you much more flexibility, okay? Much more dimensionality and much more flexibility. Um, there is a reason why you have to pay attention. That's the key, okay? Now, uh, good data, ma uh, uh, data science, okay? Data management is about inferencing, uh, inferring useful signal at massive scale. It's all about signal processing or uh, what is it? Pattern recognition. Um, which is in the domain of engineering, but we are now, now trying to understand it in our way. The, our goal is to summarize really high dimensional data in such a way that you can relate it to structural models of interest. Um, what's the economic system that you know, is driving these uh, different variables? And how do they interact with each other, influence each other is our question. Variable selection and dimension reduction is a key task over, over here. The curse of dimensionality is something that we're going to talk about later. Okay, um, So many different variables. Previously in 1960s and 70s, those mathematicians like economists in Chicago and Minnesota, they, they were able to look down upon these data guys because we did not have much data. For example, psychological biases of the investors where how would you measure those biases overconfidence or narcissism how would you measure it in 60s and 80s and 70s no answer okay millions of investors optimistic bias and negativity or pessimistic bias was there was no way of doing it measuring it but nowadays you have natural language processing and all those picture minings and um, new data unconventional data enables you to capture those things right now the problem is not about how to come up with the good data uh, how to come up with a uh, measure of a certain bias at, at all but the problem is there are so many different measures of one bias or two biases how to reduce it okay to get some uh, you know reduce the dimension the too many variables too many uh variables uh, or uh the the tools uh, the uh, too many variables are out there how do we reduce it to the absolutely necessary one okay that's about dimension reduction okay uh we want to predict and then if we th if things don't change too much right and probabilistic prediction and classification rules uh, we want to do it okay and then we need to constantly be aware of false discovery. There will be like Zimbabwe's inflation rate predicting S&P 500 things, right? S-Bank AI team, good luck. Uh, what does it mean to be big, right? Big in both the number of observations, size N. Not just 20 to 30 people. I mean, the economist looked down upon, looked down upon the behavior of finance guys because behavior of finance guys we were um, working with laboratory setting of experiments with 100 different people or 30 different sample people over there n was very small and then the economist used to say well laboratory setting yeah you know that's too you know clean data i mean cleaner 
uh, too much theoretical setting. Um, if you don't know what they're gonna do when they come to the real world, right? Those uh, Chicago guys were saying like this and then they ignore those behavioral finance guys. But now, the big data. We now have language data of billions of people. Think about cacao, right? Cacao talk. How much of a data would they have for each and every one of you? Tens of millions of people's data, right? N is huge. Number of variables, huge. Of course, all those languages, those words that you speak can be a variable, okay? ND can be one variable. How many people speak ND, 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 ND? Kim, 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 right. So many variables. Dimension of P, okay? Curse of dimension happens. We have to reduce it down to something. In these settings, you cannot look at each individual variable and make a decision, okay? Um, choose, uh, you cannot choose amongst a small set of candidate models, okay? Uh, you cannot plot every variable to look for interactions or transformations because you have literally billions of variables over there. Think about how many words that you spoke today, right? Uh, some big data tools are straightforward out of pre uh, previous statistics classes like linear regression and some are totally new something like trees random trees and uh, principal component analysis all these kind of things all require a different approach when n and p gets really really big okay uh here's one limitation that i have to manage your expectation because i'm from econometrics and then i'm more from conventional linear regressions right um so Mostly this semester, I, I think we're going to focus more on linear regression part. Um, but in the future, okay, we will explore more into those trees kind of things or PCA, principal component analysis. We'll try it this semester, but let's see. Okay.